Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the National Firearms Centre, part of the British Royal Armouries in Leeds, where we are taking a look at a Beretta Model 57. This is kind of an interesting and unusual sort of gun, if not a particularly exotic one. This is a select fire carbine uh, designed by Beretta in the 19, late 1950s, um, chambered for the 30 carbine cartridge. It is one of very few actual firearms made for 30 carbine, other than of course the M1 carbine, and these were actually made for the country of Morocco. They're the only people who ever actually bought them. So the real question to me is, why did Morocco contract for these guns instead of getting what presumably could have been easily acquired surplus M1 carbines from the United States, or even potentially from France? Now, um, Morocco gained its independence from France in uh, 1956, and it's conceivable to me that they may have simply wanted to express independence and buy guns from Beretta with no strings attached, in instead of taking aid from France or the United States or someone else, anyone else, the uh, strings attached to it. At any rate, what we have here is really kind of a cool gun. It's a tilting locking block design, two triggers, very characteristic of Beretta there, um, one semi-auto trigger, one full auto, and it's just a really neat little combination of design features. So let me go ahead and show you the inside. Working our way from front to back, we have a hooded square post front sight there, adjustable for elevation. This would not normally be on the gun. This is a British proofing mark, which was required when the gun came into the United Kingdom. We have a bayonet lug here. Uh, very similar, if maybe not interchangeable, with the M1 carbine, uh, late M1 carbine bayonet lug. Sling swivel on the side. Apparently there was a developmental version without the bayonet lug, but this is the standard production model. Ventilated upper handguard there to help the thing cool off. These are a bit unusual, first off, in having the charging handle on the right side of the gun, which is very nice for lefties, uh, but also ejecting from the left side of the gun, which is something that you usually don't find. Why they designed it that way, I do not know. There's not really very much at all written about these guns um, on record. The rear sight is a two-position simple notch, which ooh, we can flip. There we go. It's very stiff. Uh, two position notch, and then you can see the little lines there, because this is also windage adjustable. So you can screw this whole thing side to side to, uh, to get it properly zeroed. That's nice. That's a feature you don't often see on this sort of simple notch sight. On the back of the receiver we have a serial number. This one is very early, A0074, and then this is a Moroccan state crest. As I said, Morocco was the one country that actually purchased these. I'm sure Beretta would have been happy to sell them to anybody else, but almost certainly because of the easy availability of the M1 carbine, nobody else bought these. Flipping it over, we have a safety selector. That's the fire position. That's the safe position. Just blocks the trigger, or triggers. On the top of the action here, we have the abbreviation MMNAM-FES1964. I suspect 64 is the production date that, that would fit historically, but I do not know what that abbreviation is for. I suspect it is something regarding the Moroccan uh, armed forces, but hopefully one of you guys in the comments uh, can tell me what that stands for, especially if you have some knowledge of uh, Moroccan government or military history. There's a simple, a very actually small magazine release here on the bottom, which allows you to pull the magazine out. This is a 30 round magazine of 30 carbine. Note that it is substantially uh, better constructed and sturdier, uh, heftier, than the US M1 carbine magazines. These are also not interchangeable with M1 carbine magazines. Uh, I suppose it's kind of obvious from this that it's a different design, but much better magazine. This, I suspect, is actually reliable. And you'll note that uh, there is the an angle to the bottom, and uh, this actually goes in at a slight angle. It's a little difficult to discern there. But that is done to increase the feeding reliability, and also to deal with just a little bit of taper, for the same reason that the US 30-round uh, M1 carbine mags actually have a slight bend to them. Two triggers in classic Beretta style. Uh, the front one is semi-auto, the rear one is full-auto. Note that the rear one is serrated there, 
um, so that you have a tactile way to differentiate between the front and the rear triggers. And then the sling is attached in the rear just like an M1 carbine. You would have a little oiler bottle here, looped through the sling, which would then come out the back, just like an M1 carbine. Most of the disassembly is pretty easy. Um, we'll start by loosening up this front sling swivel. You don't have to take the screw out once it's loose. That just slides off the front. It is captive on there, unless you take the front sight off. We can then pull the upper handguard. Not much going on there. A little bit of a heat shield under it. And then we have one additional screw here on the back of the tang. And that is what holds the stock and the trigger group in place. Once that's loosened, we can pull it out. And then the whole stock pivots off the action, like that. About halfway down the barrel we have a little gas tappet system, very much like an M1 carbine, that's going to uh, throw a piston back just a slight distance, which impinges on this operating rod. That then cycles the bolt back. The recoil spring here is really the one real is is the one annoying piece to disassemble. So in order to get this out, we actually have to remove the whole trigger assembly. Um, the magazine well and trigger group are a separate component from the receiver. So there's one pin holding them together, right up here. You can use this screw to just push that pin. That's going to come through this side. You can pull it all the way out, and it is actually held captive by a little uh, wire spring. Then the kind of tricky part is that this whole assembly lifts up out of the receiver, Whoop, like that. And then the recoil spring immediately expands, and I'm actually rather surprised it didn't go flying across the room here. So we've got a guide rod and a recoil spring there. This guy is going to pivot down and slide backwards. There we go out of the receiver. So we've got a little T-shaped slot up here that slides into the back of the receiver. Once we have this out we can then take the bolt carrier and bolt assembly out. And nothing. once you take this out nothing holds the bolt onto the op rod and carrier. So mechanically this is a tilting bolt system. You can see the recess right there, which is the locking recess. There is this lug on the back of the bolt, and that is pushed up into that locking recess to lock the action. That is done by the back end of the bolt carrier here. So you have a hook. This is actually fairly similar to the Sturmgewehr, the German Sturmgewehr. Uh, when this is going forward, uh, the spring is pulling on this guy. So it's going to go all the way forward, and then the this pair of angles right back here, is going to push the back of the bolt up into its locking lug, like so, uh, as soon as the bolt's all the way forward and the locking recess is there for this to go into. Then uh, when you fire, the gas piston is going to hit this op rod, push it backward, and at that point the hook down here is going to catch the bolt, pull it down, and unlock it, and then cycle the whole thing. There's our bolt face. This is hammer fired, so it has a floating firing pin in there. Extractor, the ejector slot on the side. Really not much else to show you on this guy. It does fire from a closed bolt. So when we're ready to fire, pull the trigger, the front trigger, and hold it down. Hammer is going to drop. That will fire the gun. When the bolt comes backward, it's going to recock the hammer, and it's also going to trip the semi-auto disconnector, which re-engages this. And can't fire a second time until you pull the trigger again. There is a full auto disconnect up here in the front, which has to be tripped. Uh, in full auto, pull the rear trigger, hammer goes forward, it comes back, and it's going to be locked by the semi the full auto uh, trip up here. So when you when you push that forward, the hammer comes forward. That's there to prevent the, the hammer from simply following the bolt up and uh, hitting without enough energy to actually fire the cartridge. What this does is ensure that uh, the hammer stays back until the bolt goes all the way forward past this, at which point this goes down, it's tripped, it releases the hammer, and uh, fires the next shot. So 
Um, that's one of those places where you can actually build in a rate of fire reducer if you want to, uh, to delay the hammer from striking. Anyway, one other feature up here is this guy, which is the magazine hold open. So this will lock open with an empty magazine. You can see a tab right here at the back of the magazine. That is going to push this assembly up like that. If the magazine's not empty, there are cartridges in there and that tab doesn't engage. Or possibly my glove gets stuck in the magazine. So that's pretty much all the... or in the mag release. That's pretty much all the working features in here. The receiver is a quite simple forged, I assume, and milled assembly. Uh, yeah, not much to it. Your extractor, or ejector, right there. Locking recess, and that's pretty much it. These are a quite handy gun to carry. A little bit long, perhaps, but fairly light. They come in at 6.5 pounds, or 2.9 kilos. Allegedly they have a rate of fire in full auto of 500 rounds per minute. To be honest, I'm kind of dubious about that. I would expect it to be higher. Um, I always take published rates of fire with a bit of a grain of salt, because even in original manufacturer documentation they often will, uh, will, will adjust those numbers up or down as they think clients would prefer. So, And of course that sort of thing always varies with the type of ammunition. Um, and, and other factors as well. So allegedly 500 rounds a minute, whether that's entirely true I don't know or not. But it's a really neat little gun, not very many of them made, only the one contract for Morocco. So very cool of the Royal Armouries to let us take a look at this one and pull it apart. Also a big thanks to my Patreon supporters, it's you guys at a buck a month or more if you like some of the perks, uh, who make it possible for me to travel to places like the Royal Armouries in the UK and take a look at guns like this one. Thanks for watching.